The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone for coming to another episode of the database seminar series here at Carnegie Mellon University uh, on ML for databases and, and databases for ML. Uh, we're very happy to have Etienne Dylocker from Weedy8 um, to talk about uh, their system and, and what they're working on. Um, so, so the goal here is for this to sort of be an interactive process. We don't want Etienne talking to just himself. So if you've, if you've got a question, feel free to, to unmute. Uh, let us know your name, tell us where you're calling from and uh, fire the question. And if you're, if you're not able to unmute, uh, feel free to just drop it in the chat and we will uh, read that out loud as well. Um, and with that, uh, Etienne, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention Etienne is the co-founder and CTO of, of WeV8. Uh, and with that, thank you for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks for, for having me. Um, yeah. So I want to tell you a bit about more about VV8, the VV8, the product, not VV8, the, the company, but maybe also start quickly with the, the company uh, VV8. So we are a, a startup uh, that's been around for about four and a half or so years now, building the open source vector database VV8. Um, team is now around 50 people. So grown quite a bit recently, and we're doing all kinds of cool stuff uh, that hopefully um, I can share with you today. So most of this is going to be a tech deep dive. So I try to make sure that we don't have like any kind of marketing slides or, or anything on there and really go into the what I think are the, the cool concepts. Uh, I do have a small sort of higher level introduction in the beginning just to sort of paint the scene for you, like depending on, on what your background is, you may not even know what a, what a vector database is, for example. Um, so I, I want to give you the motivation of why the world needs a vector database, but then dive right into the architecture in there. I want to spend quite some time on uh, HNSW, which is a specific vector uh, index type. Then also talk about product quantization, which is a super interesting topic, in my opinion. It's about compressing vectors or reducing the memory footprint uh, that's needed for, for vectors. And also talk a bit about multi-tenancy, um, which is something that, that VV8 has a, a unique solution for. Uh, and there, the idea is like, if your user space needs to be separated into different users, user spaces, like how do you organize that in a way that it scales in there, uh, VV8 can be quite helpful. So these are kind of like the, the three deep dive topics. But let's first start with why would you want to have a vector database uh, at all? Uh, so for, for this slide, what I put together is uh, the, so I may or may not have uh, created that slide while flying on a Boeing 787. Um, and that motivated me to, to just go for the Wikipedia. I did pay for the Wi-Fi so I could go for the Wikipedia article. And just, this is the first paragraph of what comes up if you look for the, the Boeing uh, 787. And then on the right, you have a couple of keywords. And as a human being, you can probably immediately relate that these keywords are relevant for, for this kind of text. So we have stuff like aircraft, airplane, and a different spelling, like the, the, the British way of spelling uh, uh, airplane, and um, sort of also a bit more, more abstract terms like Dreamliner, which is specific to, to this model, or 787, which kind of the number appears, but not the words. And it's it's easy for you as a human being to see that these are all related, but for a traditional keyword-based search system, this would be pretty hard because I think the, the only word actually that would match in there other than, than Dreamliner would be the word airliner, not but not aircraft, airplane, and these kind of things. And um, one way to overcome this is to not index keywords, but rather try and index the meaning behind keywords. And that's, um, that's a bit fuzzy at this point, but we can make this a bit more specific by sort of placing the meaning behind these, these words and these sentences in a space and sort of imagining a 1500 dimensional vector space is super difficult, but um, we could sort of imagine this as just a two dimensional space. And um, for, for this something, an, an example that I love using is a supermarket because in a supermarket, you can kind of intuitively navigate in a supermarket by using the concept of similarity. So if you would walk into this fictional supermarket, which I give the, the creative name Whole Floats, um, you would walk in and you would see that on the left, uh, uh, you would have sort of non-food items and on the right, you would have food items. And if you're, as I should probably say that as well, if your goal is to find carrots in that supermarket, then 
you probably immediately know that you're, you don't have to look for carrots in the non-food uh, section. So you can kind of immediately discard half of the supermarket. And if you go further in that supermarket, uh, you would find sort of in the, in the bottom right of that uh, uh, illustration, you would find the produce section. And it first starts with fruit. And then if you see maybe apples and on the other end, you see potatoes over the island vegetable section, then you know that the potato is closer to the carrot that you're looking for. So you're kind of like going closer in, in that direction. And that's a uh, uh, until you eventually find the, the carrot. And that's kind of an oversimplified way of what we just talked about of these limitations rather than sort of the carrot, uh, sorry, the, uh, rather in the supermarket being organized alphabetically, it is organized by these concepts. And that's the idea of a vector space. So if you use a vector embedding model, it would put anything text or any other modality into that vector space and sort of place it in that multidimensional space that I've super simplified by, by using this uh, 2D map. And that was kind of the the whole starting idea four years ago when we started VB8. But since then, stuff has happened. Most notably, ChatGPT came up, and with ChatGPT, all of a sudden there was this this um, yeah sort of new use case, but also new problem. And um, mainly these large language models, they tend to hallucinate. So if you would ask ChatGPT right now. Does VV8 make use of Elasticsearch? It would actually say yes. So I tried this on, on ChatGPT, and that is a hallucinated answer. It gives you a very confident answer saying, is it BS? VV8 uses Elasticsearch as a storage background, blah, 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 blah. And that answer is wrong. So that's the <laughs> if there's just one takeaway from, from this session, then it's uh, VV8 does not actually use Elasticsearch in its, uh, um, in its architecture. One thing that you can do to fix this, um, because as you can see from the screenshot, is you can tell ChatGPT, please try again, but this time base your answer on the following snippet that I copy pasted from the VV8 documentation. And then there's the snippet sort of telling you VV8 uses a custom storage engine, blah, 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 all these things. And then ChatGPT sort of apologizes for, for the confusion. And in the end, if you read the summary, it says, in summary, VV8 has its own custom storage engine optimized for working with vector embeddings, and it does not rely on Elasticsearch for, for storing and indexing. So the good part is we could get ChatGPT to provide the right answer. The bad part, and this is we kind of had to tell it the answer ourselves. Like we had to say, like here is here is kind of the knowledge that um, that you need to answer the question. And now to make that sort of to, to remove me manually having to copy paste the documentation, what we can do is something called retrieval augmented generation, which is basically a fancy way of saying retrieve the documents that contain the truth from some kind of knowledge base and put them into the context window of the model so that the model can create a better answer um, based on that, that context. And um, this is sort of uh, compared to the previous one, it's a super, super simple addition. You just sort of put V8 in the pipeline there as well. And the vector embedding search that we talked about before that really helps in sort of understanding the question and mapping that to, to the right documents. And then ChatGPT can now say, um, I can't actually read it because I have the zoom overlay on here. Let me move that for a second. Uh, VV8 would say VV8 has its own custom storage engine optimized for working with vector embeddings, which is taken from the from the previous slide. And what's cool about this is, first of all, we didn't have to retrain ChatGPT. We didn't have to do any kind of model training. We could on the fly adapt this simply by looping in the right context. Um, and we could also change this on the fly. So a new document could appear tomorrow, or we could remove a document, for example. So if if there was a document that we don't want to show for whatever reason, we could sort of deviate as a database. And in a database, you can, you can sort of do CRUD operations. And that gives you a way to sort of influence what the, the large language model would produce on the fly. Um, now I can't switch slides anymore. Okay, so uh, we have an example app that's called Verba, which is a, it's the golden rag retriever. So it's a pun on, on rag and this um, being this nice doggy in the, in the image. Um, so this is kind of meant as a, just take your own data and put it into VV8 and have a, a, a retrieval augmented generation kind of example. And uh, for this one, the, the standard one uh, comes with our own documentation. So uh, to sort of prove my point, I put the same question into Verba, asked it, does VV8 make use of, um, of Elasticsearch? And Verba luckily gave the right answer and said, VV8 itself does not make use of Elasticsearch, blah, 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 a bit more, more 
uh, context around it. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. You have the model creating that nice answer that um, that uh, yeah, sort of the, the the generative part, but also you can base it on facts that you can control yourself and that you can change on the fly. Yeah, so so these are right now, I would say the main use case, there are plenty more use cases for, for vector similarity search, could be recommendations, could be all kind of kind of other ones, but these are the, the biggest reasons that we see right now of people adopting, uh, uh, adopting BB-8. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to dive a bit deeper into BB-8's architecture. So if anyone has any questions on the, on the previous part before I, I switch topics, now would be your chance. But also, of course, we can we can uh, talk about them later as well. Um, VB8 uses collections and shards. So, small disclaimer here: when I say collections, this is actually if you if you open up the VB8 documentation right now, you will come across the term classes. This is something that we're currently renaming. So, we got some feedback of like collection being the more intuitive way of describing uh, things in the in the NoSQL world. And um, so, in a VB8 setup, I, I used setup here as a relatively broad term, not to mean it's like a specific sort of single node setup or a cluster of VBA is really just your VBA setup in however way you would have it set up. And you could have um, sort of three collections here, like article, authors, events. So basically it's like your, from a user perspective, like your way of, of um, creating similar to like a, a table or so in, in the SQL world. Within a collection, we have shards. The purpose of shards is basically vector data or, or vector search in general can be quite resource intense. And we'll, later we'll focus on how to reduce that, that cost through uh, product quantization. Um, but if you have a data set that's too large to fit a single node, then sharding is a way to basically split it up. And then I have a slide on that uh, in, a, in a second. So one collection can comprise multiple shards. And then within a shard, we have essentially three parts. One is the vector index. I'm using HNSW here as sort of pretending that's the only option. That's actually not true. This is this is pluggable in VB8, but uh, the like 99% of use cases that we see right now are um, sort of done with HNSW. Um, in the future, there, there will probably be more. There is also an object store. So this is also very important in VB8's architecture. Um, while it is vector native, it's still a pretty decent key value store under the hood. So there are no limitations around uh, kind of objects that, that you could store with your data. So if you retrieve something, you don't have to, let's say, use a secondary system that uh, stored your original object and then resolve that, like where, where the vector search would just give you back your ID and then you have to, to go to that one, but you can store uh, the full object with, with VB8 as well. And there is an inverted index that also uses an LSM store. And uh, this inverted index is actually to, to my knowledge, is the, the only LSM store that actually sort of natively understands roaring bitmaps. So that's that's a, an optimization that we made for, for basically combining um, different filters, doing like AND operations or operations, these kind of things efficiently. And this all kind of lives together in that self-contained unit, the shard, and um, sort of, yeah. Works works well together. So for example- Etienne, a quick clarification question, and you could yes. defer it if you're gonna talk about it next. Uh, will this also, if I have a collection of documents, let's say a whole bunch of PDFs that have OCR, and I'm going to go store indices in it, in the object store, what can I put in? Can I keep the OCR document in there too? Or what's the scope of what you would suggest people put into the uh, yes. storage layer here? Yes, yes. So typically what we see is you would put, let's say you have a PDF as, as the raw source and, and let's maybe say the PDF also has images because I think images makes it makes it very interesting. Then what you could do is store um, basically the the OCR text as just as chunk text. So for example, for for hybrid search, um, if you want to do do sort of a, a both keyword matching or P keyword scoring like DM25 in combination with vector search, then you actually need the text chunk. What you could even do is store the raw input, like the the blob that is your PDF. Um, not sure if that's the the best idea because if that gets a lot of data, this probably makes more sense to just put that into super cheap storage like cloud storage and just link it from VB8. But technically, you could you could do it. You could if you say like, okay, I'm okay with using SSD storage or so to store the the raw blob in there. Then you can store anything uh, basically. But typically, what we see is like a sort of semi-structured 
JSON or so, where you would have maybe title and then the title paragraph and the paragraph or, or something like that. And the, the idea really from our perspective is we want to be able to serve um, a search request end to end so um, that you don't have to, to serve at search time just because you're missing some information um, that you have to query a second database system for, for that part. Got it. Thank you. This this may be something you're going to get to shortly, but but how do you how do you do sharding over these vector spaces? Like, is it is it something? Maybe you're going to get there. I'm just curious how you find like a sharding key or. Yeah. Let me let me go to the next slide. I hope that hope that moves in the in the right direction. So um, yeah, so for for sharding, typically we shard on on a specific key in sort of a two-step approach where the um, the key itself would match to uh, a, a virtual shard and the virtual shard would match a physical shard. And um, basically with, with consistent hashing, where the idea is that if you ever like change the number of shards to minimize the data movement. Um, and this is this is actually something that we, we don't have a feature for, for resharding yet. Because um, the, in, in typically, and especially with HMSW, like the, the cost of building the index is relatively high. So recharting on the fly is not something that, that we typically see people do, but we have the general architecture in place. Um, so this is similar to, to like DynamoDB or Cassandra or something like that, um, where if we would say like, hey, we want to change the number of shards on the fly, we already have the mapping there to um, to reduce the amount of data movement to, to make sure that, uh, yeah, basically only a minimal amount would have to be moved. Um, other than that, what shard do you shard on? Do you oh, just so shard it like randomly partition the data, or do you shard in a more systematic way where you might be able to filter shards during when a search query, or do you have to search all the shards on every search query? Um, yeah. So right now, um, we just do a hash on the ID field, so that's okay. that's basically random. Uh, but there is a second scenario. So this is why this slide says sharding in a single tenancy situation. There is a second scenario that we'll get to later uh, for multi-tenancy, where it's not using filters, but it's kind of kind of doing exactly um, what you're what you're hinting at. If you already know that part of your data is specific to a specific shard or to a specific node, there's no need to search across all of them. So in that case, it's actually different. This right here is mainly for the idea where it's agnostic of, of specific filters, where the idea is really you have a, a multi-billion scale data set that's just too large to fit on a single node. And you you sort of don't have any kind of um, good criterion to, to narrow it down further. So, so just because it's the 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 uh, because of the nature of the query, basically you know that you have to hit all shards anyway. So this is kind of for for this case, and then then later in the multi tenancy section, uh, we'll talk a bit more about the how to narrow the scope down based on based on the query. Um, yeah. So let me see. Yeah. So I mentioned HNSW, um, which is the hierarchical or hierarchical navigable small world is a mouthful. I struggle with it every time, um, which is a, a very common um, vector index. You see this a lot right now. I think sort of it's it's often used depending on on what the perspective of the vendor is. Either they use it as a positive signal to say like, hey, it's a super fast and performant index. Or if the vendor has something else, they use it as a negative, saying like, "Hey, it's an index with a with a very high build cost." So it's it's just engineering. There are trade offs, and um, HNSW makes one of those those um, sort of trade offs. Um, on the one hand, for it's an approximate index, so it gives up a bit of accuracy, but you can still get to a very very high level of accuracy to gain a lot of uh, performance. And then the other the other trade-off, if you compare it, so this is compared to an exact index where you would have to do like a brute force search. And then if you compare it to other indexes, like uh, uh, HNSW tends to be very fast on the query side, but relatively slow to build or relatively compute intensive to, to build. Um, and HNSW is a, is a graph-based index. And as I mentioned in the intro, like I want to focus a bit on, on this part because I think it's 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 yeah, it's nice to visualize and nice to to um, understand sort of how you can use a graph to do an approximate nearest neighbor search. And this graph is a proximity graph, and the, the navigable small world part in in the name um, is based on the concept that. If you know someone who knows someone who knows someone with, I think, six or seven hops, you can basically get to any person in the world. So even if they're like completely globally distributed, just by by sort of using those graph connections, 
um, you can navigate basically anywhere. And this is the same idea in this in this proximity graph. So don't think of this so much as like a two-dimensional vector space. Two-dimensional is just the, the, the representation. Think of this as no matter what the dimension between two points are, as long as you have a distance metric, so cosine similarity or dot product or something like that, uh, you can represent this basically as a one-dimensional uh, um, I don't want to say vector, but a one-dimensional value is a scalar vector uh, value, basically, that tells you if two points are closer to one another or further from uh, one another. And we can make use of this to do a similarity search. So what we've introduced in this new point here is uh, the concept of a query vector. That's that green dot on the right. And just visually, you can immediately tell if I want to go for the top three nearest neighbors, uh, that's basically just a circle around that dot, and that should be those those three points on the left. Uh, sorry, on the right. Um, also, what we've introduced is the concept of an entry point, which is just a, for the sake of this demonstration, just just assumes a randomly chosen point that we use every time to enter the graph. And now, what we have to do is, as efficiently as possible, get from our entry point to the query point to those three points that are highlighted in that in that circle. And for this, in sort of slightly oversimplified terms, uh, what HNSW has is this following algorithm. The idea is that basically from, ever, from wherever you are, which in the beginning is your, your entry point, um, your goal or, or what you can do is evaluate the edges, so these sort of outgoing edges, and jump onto those new points. And then for every point, you can, since it's just the similarity uh, comparison again to the query vector, you can do a calculation whether that new point brings us closer to where we want to go or whether that uh, gets us farther away from it. And using those calculations, you can actually pick the best point of your newly discovered set and make that the current candidate. So you can see this is like a, like a sort of almost recursive kind of algorithm. Um, and then um, another sort of uh, um, helper is Let's try not to score any point twice. So we need to keep some sort of a list of what points we've already visited. And our early exit condition or our exit condition is basically when we can't improve the scores anymore by evaluating our neighbors, that's when we're done. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through an example of that in a second, um, just sort of to, to make it easier to understand the colors in the next slide. We already saw the entry point, the Curie vector, and the, the sort of blue, which is just points that were there in the beginning. Now I'm introducing two more colors. One is the gray one, which is just, this is a point that we already scored and visited in the past, um, but we discarded it. And uh, then the, the light green is basically just to, to highlight what our current best uh, candidates are. So this is our, the same graph as before. The only difference is that I've highlighted the edges that are available to us from that entry point. So the idea is like right now we can evaluate those four other points. And if we do that, we can see that the graph now looks like this. So a lot has changed with just sort of one iteration. Um, some of those points, like the point on the left um, is marked gray. We've discarded it because it didn't actually bring us any closer to where we want to go. Um, out of the other three points, they're basically all three, they're green, but one is also red because that that's the closest. So you can kind of think of them um, probably should have been like both green and red at the same time. Basically what that means is those three are currently our best, sort of our closest uh, uh, matches, which are already better than the entry point. And out of those three, specifically the one that's that's highlighted in red, this is our new candidate, our new entry point. So we can basically um, do the same thing again from that perspective, which gives us two new edges. So why just two? Why is there one edge in blue? That's because it would point to a point that we've already visited. So we're not going to follow that edge again because we know we, we already visited that. So it only gives us two new options. So if we repeat that, we move to, to that point, which is like, this is just, just trust me that this point is actually closer than the one in the, in the bottom. That's like very hard to see on the, on the slides. Um, same thing from here. We've actually only discovered one new edge um, because we're not going sort of on the top left edge, because that would just lead us to a point uh, that we've already discarded. And then if we do that again, we can move to, to our current candidate here. Similar situation here. One of the edges actually points to something that we've already visited, but one edge gets us to a newer point. We will make that our new entry point. And then uh, finally, if we do, do the same thing again, 
we're now in the exit condition where we can't actually move any closer anymore because anything that's connected to our three possible candidates right now would not get us closer to where we want to go. So if we would take the top green one and evaluate the edge sort of to the bottom left, that would be, be farther away. And similarly, uh, for, for the, the bottom green one, we could only go left, which would also bring us farther away from our, our query. So now what we've kind of done is like we've navigated this graph closer to our query vector. And in this case, um, we've actually identified the, the top three exact neighbors. So that is something that's definitely, definitely possible. But you can see that sort of roughly half of the graph is still blue. And that's our, that's our efficiency saving, basically. So if we had done a brute force search, we would have not have a, a graph at all. And we would have just scored every single point in that data set compared to our, our query vector. But because we, we were able to follow this graph, um, we actually managed to not score half of them. And this is, of course, a super small and, and uh, small example just for, for demonstration purposes. But as this graph grows, there is more and more that we can we can sort of not score. And this is where the uh, performance boost in HNSW uh, comes from. Let me just, just because it's nice, let me just go back and sort of do this again at, at slightly higher speed so you can see it like almost like an, like an animation of how we're traversing that graph until we find our results. So you mentioned these are these are approximate uh, sort of sort of indexes. Like, are there parameters you tune here to to yes. adjust that or and, and sort of okay. yes, how bad can um, it get? I guess like with with yeah these approximate structures. Yeah, you can sort of one thing that's super important for HMSW, and that's something that um, that we actually ran into quite a bit in the beginning is you need a data set with a let's say useful distribution of of where your data is at so if you would randomly generate uh vector embeddings just like a sort of random function um you would have sort of all distances would be on average pretty much the same that would make for for a horrible graph but if you use real life data sets so for example um uh, yeah just text or so that that tends to have these like natural clusters it will make for a way better distribution. So that is something to, to keep in mind for, for this sort of graph to be efficient. Um, but then you also have parameters that you can tune. So one thing that's sort of implicit in this graph is just the number of connections. So it's kind of, I think that the limit, I think is four in this graph because no one, no one has more, like no point is more than, than four outgoing connections. Um, another parameter that you can tune that um, I sort of oversimplified in this is the um, the candidate scope. So I've just pretended right now that we're looking for three results, but I've also said that that we're only ever looking at three candidates. In real life, that those are actually two different numbers. So you would have the results uh, number, which in, in VV8 is called the, the limit, or typically it's just called the, the top K. And then you have this parameter in HNSW that's called EF, which is the the sort of candidate window. So you had, it, it's quite un, uh, quite common that you would maybe search for your top 10 results with an EF of 128. And that would mean that you would have roughly 10X or, or 12X um, the number of, of results set in your, in your candidate set. And that gives you an immediate sort of query time trade-off between performance and accuracy because the larger you, you create the, the sort of temporary result set, the more points you discover that you have to evaluate, but also the more points you discover. So the better, the better, or the more likely it is that the, the search gets better. And then another um, uh, uh, parameter that you can tune that I didn't really didn't really talk about it. So, so here I just pretended that the graph was already there, but of course there's also a build phase to it. And for the build phase, you actually do a search on the graph to find out where to place a new node. And there you use the same sort of the same EF parameter, and that's called EF construction. Then, where if you do a better search at build time, you're more likely to place the node in the correct place, which then in turn builds a, a better graph. So that's another sort of um, uh, query time versus build time kind of trade off that that you can do. And there on our on our website, you can see all kinds of graphs. So so this is like the or if you look at uh, ANN benchmarks from from Eric Bernhardsen. Um, he has this independent sort of scoring of different uh, vector libraries and stuff. And you will always find these graphs um, that show the trade-off between, I think he, he uses throughput, but the throughput is just, it's single-threaded. So throughput is really just latency, basically. Um, 
versus accuracy. And then you get these like nice curves where like the, the top, either the top left or the top right corner would be the, the ideal scenario that nicely sort of visualizes that, that trade-off. Um, one thing though, so, so far, um, I've actually ignored one of the parts of, of Asian Stone. Let's just drink some water one sec. So everything that I've described right now, other than the parameters, they're actually specific to HNSW, is more NSW, which was the, the predecessor to, to HNSW. So we haven't really talked about that hierarchy at all yet. And this is uh, on the next slide. So look at this sort of 3D flattened 3D view of this 2D graph, where I've again highlighted a couple of points. So the colors have different meanings right now. Um, Really what they mean is those. this is the yellow point, the green point, and the red point. This is really just so you can find them again. They're, they no longer mean like entry point or, or query point or something. Because now what we can do is introduce a second layer. And in this second layer, and this is the reason for, for, those, um, for those colors, we actually have some of those points that also existed on a lower layer. We also have them now on a higher layer. But also we're, we don't have some of the other points. And what that means is since we have fewer points, on average, our edges are longer, which also means that if we move, sort of if we navigate the, the top graph, we're much more likely to cover more distance with a single hop. So you can kind of think this, and, and, and the, the query retrieval, this I should probably also say, the query retrieval goes top to, to bottom. So you would start, start on the top layer where you have very, very few points and would go down, um, to sort of see a uh, down layer per layer as soon as you've you've exhausted one layer. And this is why you need to have points that are uh, present on both layers. So you could go from the top graph, you could say like, let's move to the yellow point and then you can't move any further to the left because there's no better result. So the yellow point would now become your entry point on the lower layer. And in a sense, I like in my brain, I think of this kind of like a binary search because like you eliminate a, a large portion of the search space on a higher level. And then you go down on a lower level and do a more granular search to actually retrieve the, the kind of points because if the higher layer is, is missing some points, uh, then of course the, you, you can never uh, discover them for retrieval. So it's sort of similar to a skip list index. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. I think skip list is, is probably the better example even than a, than a binary search, yeah. Um, okay, one other thing that is super interesting in HNSW that sort of when we first, the, the HNSW paper is older than, than BB-8. So when we started, this was something that, that uh, we had to learn and it was actually quite quite difficult, but it's a super simple concept actually. This is how do you know which are the right edges? And there's a heuristic in, in HNSW that, um, that does that. And for this, let's see, oh, there we go. Um, if we look at this, so this is this is another graph right now. Uh, and, and uh, right now, this is focused sort of, or this is centric. The, the view is centric of that red point right now. So this is not meant to be the whole graph. This is just sort of, I am the red point and I could be connected to, to all of these points. And just intuitively, you would probably think this may not be the ideal graph. Because if every single one of those points sort of has a, a pattern like this, then everything is connected to everything, which is great for connectivity, but also doesn't actually give us any kind of performance boost anymore because like if if evaluating the neighbors of a single point means evaluating the entire graph then it's just the brute force search so probably there is a better way and of course one one thing to to uh, one way to move around this is just to limit the number of connections but if you limit them you want to keep sort of the most valuable connections and um what this heuristic does in in simplified terms is basically at some point you cross the threshold of your connections. So, so you would have this as another tunable parameter in HNSW, which is called max connections or M short. Um, if you keep sort of during build time, if you keep identifying your perfect neighbors and you keep adding connections at some point, a node just runs out of, out of space for connections. So let's say your M is 64, or in this case, I don't know, it's like 17 or something like that. Once you cross that, that, um, that threshold, you don't want to say like, okay, I'll never accept new connections again, because then you can never connect to that neighbor. Instead, what you want to do is prune them. And the way that the, the pruning algorithm works is it sort of temporarily removes all of those connections and starts from scratch and starts connecting um, points again. And for this one, sort of the, the four that are highlighted here, they are 
from the perspective of, of that red point, there are pretty obvious connections because there is no way to identify those points through a different point. So these points are the closest neighbors to the red point, and they're not the closest neighbor to, to any other point that we already have. So this sort of builds up gradually. So you could think of this, I kind of know, in a, in a clockwise pattern or so. And now the interesting thing is every other point on that graphic has a point uh, uh, that is already connected to the red point that is closer to it than to the red point. So in other words, it was a very complex way of saying, from now on, we're only going to do second grade connections. And all of a sudden, we have something that resembles more a graph. So we've, we've kind of taken all these, these points that were previously connected to the red point and pruned them in a way that if it makes more sense to connect through them or connect through an existing point uh, uh, to that red point, then we're not going to connect them to the red point itself. And this sort of um, helps a lot in reducing unnecessary connections because you can just rely on your neighbor to discover um, a, a point rather than, than having to be connected to everyone uh, directly. And that also means that on average, then it leads to longer connections because if your sort of search scope is like, like right now, uh, if, if the red point can have 17 connections, right now it only has uh, four. So you have lots of space and if this is sort of a multi-dimensional space, then it's not as crowded as this two-dimensional space. So there's way more room to to make uh, a connection to the red point, which over time leads to a, a better graph. Okay, that oh, let me see my slides not not loading. Okay, that was that was the HNSW part, which um, I think is also kind of the the uh, yeah prerequisite to talk about product monetization. Um, any okay. before I switch topics? Any any more questions on that? Could you go back to the previous slide for a little more? Mm -hmm. uh, so every single data point I'm looking at here is an object in the database, is it? Mm -hmm. Correct. Like everyone would be like one one document. Uh, yeah, you 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 yeah. wouldn't necessarily like you could have documents that don't have a vector attached to them, but this is every object that has a vector basically. Would you ever consider constructing an artificial point just to kind of uh? final center let's say that red point that you have there right now didn't exist uh is constructing an artificial point so that you have a very convenient neighbor something you've considered or that people do it's a super interesting point i think not directly that we've that we've considered this what you can do is sort of if you think of um filtering for example like in filtering you remove some points which means that your connectivity drops then you can create these these um sort of edges again, but I think typically what you would do is rather than creating artificial points, probably just create artificial edges, like edges that wouldn't be part of the, the algorithm, but just say like, okay, we have these like two distinct clusters and all that's missing is one edge to go from one cluster to the next. And now they're, they'd be connected again. Oh, cool. thank you. How, uh, oh, it, then, uh, yeah, how frequently yeah. do you rebuild this indices as data gets added and deleted? Uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about yeah. that. Oh yeah, very very good question. Um, so my my slides are currently yeah uh, I don't know my my slides are a bit slow to load whenever there's a there's a lot of color on the slide. So let me go back to that one. Um, so adding data, kind of this happens on the fly. Like HNSW is built in a way where you never have a build phase and then a query phase, but because the the building phase is just searching and inserting. If you purely add data, there's there's no maintenance that you would ever have to do. Like your, your graph would never degrade over time. This is a bit different when you add deletes. So for deletes, you have two options. One option is you would sort of temporarily mark a point as deleted, which would be sort of like a, a lookup list. And then you know, hey, if, if uh, this point is marked as deleted, I can no longer include it in the result set, um, but I still need that point because if I would just remove it right now, I could risk my graph no longer being connected. Um, so right. one option is basically this, we wait for those tombstones to pile up. And at some point we say we have 30% tombstones. Now it's inefficient because we have 30% of, of edges that, that don't help anymore. Let's rebuild the graph. The other, so this is this makes a ton of sense if you have like bulk deletes or, or any other kind of event where, where all of a sudden you have a lot of deletes that you need to cover in a short period of time. The other approach, and this is actually the one that we do in, in VV8, um, or that we typically do in VV8, 
is to try to repair the graph. So what we do is we iterate over points that are marked as deleted. So, so basically we do, we do both. So we use this, um, this temporary list just to make sure that the moment that the deletes comes in, um, that you start or, or you still serve the right, uh, uh, the right uh, queries by not including something that was marked as deleted. But also in the background, we would iterate over that list and we would say like, hey, if we remove that point right now, we're basically removing a connection from, so if we, if we take the, the red point as an example on this slide, if we were to remove that point right now, these other four clusters would no longer be connected. So we then start sort of rebuilding and reassigning them to, to one another. And that is a very costly process. Um, so it's kind of the, 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 if you do the bulk rebuild, that would be the more efficient process. If you do the on the fly rebuild, it works kind of well if you have not too many deletes. So if you, if you just from a user perspective, like, I don't know, they, they upload uh, like 80% of the, the uploads are inserts and maybe 10% are updates and 10% are delete or so. And that happens over time. Then you can use your compute to sort of drag it out and repair it on the fly, which is also nice that you don't have ever have this like sort of um, big build phase where you would then have to either uh, work on a copy in the meantime or would have to sort of uh, uh, mark it as read only in the meantime, but you can sort of do this just as the, the regular process. Thank you. And do you ever see applications or use or scenarios where if I just look at the vector database, forget about the actual data, just the vector component of it, where the amount, the number of edges that you have across all the layers is way more than the number of nodes, or do they tend to be roughly of the same order? Um, yeah, so this is this is controlled by the algorithm because it has that parameter to to sort of keep the edges in check. So you would Got it. typically, I mean, the, the point that was last inserted probably has the fewest edges because it hasn't been able to be discovered by other points that were inserted yet. But overall, the algorithm itself, through this pruning and, and sort of starting this pruning whenever the, the edges become too much, keeps that in, in check. So, Got it. Um, Thank you. Way that makes sense. Um, I, I noticed that we're sort of a bit going a bit slower than I had anticipated. So we're only starting into the, the new section right now. Are we still good for time or should we? Yeah, we've still got, you know, 17 minutes or so. So, I mean, okay, great, great. Then we to... can tackle the, the, the product yeah. quantization because uh, I think that's that's the, the next most interesting one. Um, cool. Okay. So, so some motivation for, for what product quantization is and why we would need that. Um, here are three of the most common from, from our perspective, embedding models that we see right now. Uh, the biggest one, uh, being open AI's ADA two, um, which has a dimensionality of, uh, 1536. So that's, um, Typically, you would assume, or we assume, uh, that uh, these embeddings are float 32s. So that's four bytes per dimension. So just for a single embedding, that's already six kilobytes. And therefore, for uh, a million of them, that would be six gigabytes. Uh, even more so for Cohere, have updated their new uh, default embedding model, which is now 4,000 dimensions. So that's sort of 16 kilobytes and 16 gigabytes, respectively. And then uh, a sentence bird, open source sentence bird model. Um, that's the the best ranked on the Esbird website, which is a, a website from Niels Reimers, who sort of trained. He he works for Cohere now, but before that, he trained open source uh, sentence bird models, and also has like accuracy benchmarks, which is really really great to to sort of uh, figure out which works well in, in which domain and these kind of things. And there we have seven hundred sixty eight uh, dimensions which sort of leads to, yeah, with a million embeddings to three gigabytes. So this is just a million embeddings. If you have a billion, then those gigabytes turn into terabytes. And that's kind of the point where you start thinking like, if those vector embeddings need to be in memory, which is by the way, also something that should probably be challenged and <laughs> only have 17 minutes left. So for now, let's assume that they, they live in memory. Um, what can we do to reduce the memory uh, footprint of them? And one thing that you can do is called product quantization. And product quantization is another one of those where for us, it was so hard to figure this out. Like there, there's been research for, for years, but to me, it was like, if I felt it was never accessible. So what I'm gonna to try to do in the next couple of minutes is try to make that knowledge accessible because the, the, um, the idea behind it is actually not that complex. So what we have here is basically just 
uh, clustering. So we decided to take our data set or take a portion of our data set and try to figure out what would be clusters in that data set that would kind of uh, roughly represent the, the distribution of our vector. So this could be something like a k-means algorithm, for example, that you could run on your, your data. And then you would come up with these sort of white points um, that are the, the centroids of those clusters. And then you see that the colorful areas would basically be, um, if it's within one of those areas, it would be closest to, to the centroid of that particular uh, cell. Um, what you can do with this is uh, you can assign just some numbers for now to that, that cluster. So it kind of went in a spiral pattern. Here's so a zero, one, two, three. And then at some point, I think it goes all the way up to 18. And since we started with zero, that means we currently have 19 of those clusters. In reality, you probably um, want a number that it, that makes more sense than 19. So for example, if you use one byte, that would be an unsigned integer uh, with eight bits. So that would give you 256 options. And that is, if we think about the next step of what we want to do with those clusters, that probably makes a lot of sense. So in real life, you wouldn't have 19, but you would have, for example, two uh, to the eighth power options, uh, which would be two, 256. Now, how, how does that help us? So if we just pick every single vector and we say like, hey, we assign every vector to one of those, those clusters, then we just have 256 options. So for a data set of millions or, or hundreds of millions of objects, that's not a lot of diversity. So we need kind of more than just 256 mm -hmm. options. And what the, the PQ algorithm does, um, which I think is, is super smart. Let me see, I already clicked next, but the next slide is not loading. So let me maybe try again. Okay. Um, what it does is it splits our continuous length vector into individual segments. And then instead of assigning the whole vector to one of those clusters, what we do is we assign each segment to, to that cluster. So with this sort of fictional four-dimensional vector here, could be way longer, but it's easier to fit it on a slide if it's just four dimensions. Um, we would say for each of those segments, and we have here just one dimension per segment, um, which basically means every every segment is just one float, we do a similarity comparison using the same similarity metric that we would use. So this could be like cosine similarity or dot product or something. We use that to define what is the closest of those clusters. And then that, that would be some kind of a number. Now you'll see why it made sense to encode this in something like a byte, because now we have one of those 256 options for each segment which means that our four dimensional vector, which was four floats previously, can now be represented by just four bytes. So even just by, by using um, one dimension per segment, we could kind of reduce this from, from yeah, uh, 32 bits to eight bits per dimension while keeping the same dimensionality. And, and obviously this is, this is a lossy algorithm, right? Like we've, we've, we're now using a byte to represent um, this information that previously was represented in, in a float. Um, so we lose some information, but also we just gained 4x compression. And we can take that one step further by not saying a segment is just one dimension in our vector. We could say a segment is multiple dimensions in our vector. So for, for my slide, it was easiest to do just two. In reality, what we would see is like six or eight works really great on, on something like uh, OpenAI embeddings. And now we just do the exact same thing. Instead of doing a comparison on a single number, what we would do is do a comparison on that like mini sub vector basically. So from position zero and one, we would compare that to position zero and one off are 256 clusters. And then in this example, this would mean that 83 is the best segment. And then same again for, for position two and three. So now what we've done, we got the 4x compression from using bytes instead of floats, but also we use two dimensions per segment. So our, our final vector is now only half the length of the input vector. So all of a sudden we now have 8x compression. And again, same same sort of caveat as before, because we're sort of putting more information in, in fewer bits, we, we lose some accuracy. And if, if, if this is all that you do, um, now you see one of those, those sort of graphs where like the, the top left corner would be the ideal scenario, the, the bottom right, uh, sorry, the, the x-axis is uh, query time. 
in the y-axis is accuracy. So you'd want to have as little query time as possible and as high recall as, as possible. And now you see if this is all you do, and now I need to move my zoom thing again because it's covering the, the legend. Um, you see the number of dimensions per, per segment. And you can see if you just do it, do the, the 4x, just the sort of um, float to byte, it's still fairly accurate. But if you do two dimensions per segment or four or eight, accuracy starts dropping very, very rapidly. And this is um, only on, I think, the SIF data set, which is just 128 dimensional, uh, but it gets worse if you have higher dimensions. So from this alone, you could kind of argue that this is not really too too usable because like eighty percent accuracy or so is is too low. Like you, typically, what you would want is I don't know in the like high nineties, ninety seven, ninety eight or so is typically what what uh, users tend to be happy uh, with. Um, so what you can do is see um, new graphic. Um, you can simply simply fix this by overfetching a bit. And um, great thing that we talked about tunable parameters in HNSW, because what we do in HNSW just for to overcome the, the inaccuracy of HNSW is we overfetch. So we talked about this EF parameter before, where you would um, you would uh, sort of uh, keep 128 candidates, even if you're only looking for the top 10 results. And if you do that, with PQ, and then you use your candidate list, which is still a tiny fraction compared to the entire data set. But if you use those 128 candidates, and now you you load the um, the original uncompressed vector from disk, and just within that top 128, you start re-ranking or re-scoring based on the actual uh, sort of uh, uh, distance, you can actually get quite close to the accuracy that you had uh, before. So what you can see is here. So so sorry, this I, I took those two graphics from like two different blog posts, and they're they're kind of saying the same thing, but in a slightly different format. So in this one, we actually have the accuracy on the x-axis. So further to the right is more accuracy, and on the y-axis we have we have uh, the throughput, um, which I guess you can use as sort of a um, a similar way because this is done single threaded. So it's kind of similar to the, the latency. So now actually the, the top right corner is the ideal scenario. And what you can see is that for almost every, uh, sorry, sorry, is it a question or someone? No, okay. Um, um, what you can see is that for every value um, that we have on the blue line, which is our uncompressed control compared to the red line, ignore the, the orange and the green for now. Um, for every value that we have, we can actually find a point on that line where we have the same accuracy, just at slightly slower throughput. So if we take, for example, the, the 0 0.95, because I can use my mouse, if you take the 0.95% the or, or, or sorry, the 0 0.95 is 95% accuracy, then we can say if you want 95% accuracy, you could either do that uncompressed with, I don't know, 320 or so QPS, so QPS just queries per second, so throughput measurement, uh, or you could use the compressed one. And this was done with six dimensions per segment. So that's a 24x compression of the, the vector space. Um, you would get all those memory savings. And all you would have to drop is to maybe 270 or so queries per second. So that's a pretty good trade-off. Like you would, I don't know, lose like 20% or so throughput. But all of a sudden, you gained a, a lot of Gained uh, uh, um, yeah, a lot of memory savings or, or reduced memory savings. Uh, yes, question. Yeah, so you said with quantization, um, the accuracy gets lower, but I kind of lost you how what what exactly overfetching and rescoring does to uh, mitigate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the idea is um, because you have these this this compression, you kind of add some distortion to to the actual distances. So you're not comparing the real distance anymore, but you're kind of comparing like approximate vectors. So also that makes the distance comparison approximate. And if you combine that with HMSW for navigating the graph, it's actually still quite good. Like you can still navigate the graph with compressed vectors because sort of having a good enough thing is, is great to sort of get you in the right direction. But then if you calculate, if you just stop there, 
because we had this distortion, we were kind of so close, but actually our true top 10 or maybe in I don't know, position 14, 18, 19 or so. So they're still within that slightly larger window that we retrieve. But if we just cut it off after 10, we actually have, I don't know, the true position 17, 24, et cetera. So what we do is we take that whole list which is in our case, 128 examples, which is still a tiny, tiny fraction of, let, let's say this was done on, so, so this actually was done on a million vectors, this graphic right here. So having to load 128 vector embeddings from disk, which of course is something that, that can also be, be optimized for, um, and rescoring them, sort of brute forcing the true nearest neighbors out of 128 is still a fraction of the computations that you would have to do if you had just taken that entire data set and sort of brute force it. And, and, and not just as a fraction of the calculations, but also to even be able to uh, brute force the entire data set, you would either have to have the entire data set in memory, which sort of means you, you also lose the memory savings, or you would have to sort of stream the entire data set from disk, which would make it way slower because now you're talking sort of, I don't know, 16 gigabytes or so, like even with a fast SSD, just sort of streaming that, um, you'd probably be disk bound before you would be CPU bound in, in that scenario. Does that answer it? Yes, thank you. Cool. Martin, are you able to unmute? Yep, I can. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, uh, two questions, but they're both related, so I'll ask at the same time. Uh, first, under the assumption that quantization is generally going to be data set dependent in some shape. And so if you add or remove elements, the optimal quantization boundaries is going to change. This also will now impact how much you want to overfetch. So two questions. In your view or in Weaviates in general, how do you feel about creating a huger overfetch boundary. So let's say you expect maybe the top 10 to always be in the top 17, 25, et cetera. You just shoot for top 50 and you never have to rebuild the index. That's question one. Question two, if you do start noticing, uh, I guess, how would you track this deterioration of quality when you're like, okay, data has changed too much. We now have to recalculate our entire uh, index. So how do we balance all of these things with the constant evolution of the data? Yeah, great great question. So maybe to start with the the first part is you do it, it is data set dependent that is that is correct and you do need some kind of a sample to to come up with a good uh quantization uh model basically. So what we see in practice is if someone has, let's say, a billion scale data set, they would import a small fraction of that, so maybe a million or so objects, and use that to fit uh, the, the model for the entire data set. And that is surprisingly often already enough. So that, that doesn't sort of take the data shift over time yet into, into account, but it just means like you don't actually need your full data set as long as you have sort of some diversity in the data set so that you don't, but like the, the worst thing that you could do is basically if you would, let's say if your, your data was nicely evenly distributed across this 2D space, but somehow you would import it in order and you would first import all the points that, that are just close to the bottom left corner. And then you would fit your PQ model based on the bottom left corner. And then you would sort of import the, the rest. That would be a, a, a pretty bad uh, a model. But if you have, sort of sampled points that represent the entire space, then the only drift that you need to take care of is sort of if the whole space drifts, which is less less likely. So in practice, just sort of overfetching a bit more or, or sort of uh, overfetching in gen general can go a pretty long way. Um, that said, and then this is, I think, your, your second question of how do you measure it? That is a, a a pretty difficult one to answer because with these like sample data sets, it's super easy because you can just brute force the the true nearest neighbors once, and you can just compare your recall um, by by just looking at at uh, yeah your your approximate ones versus the real ones. With real data, that's a lot more more difficult. So one one way to do it would be you could occasionally do like sampled brute force comparisons and just see like does your your recall drift over time and that could maybe be a good way to to identify like okay now it's drifted too much and now we need to do something about it 
All right. Okay. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you for the insight. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I'm I'm also noticing that we're we're approaching time. I think the PQ section is is done. I would have another section on on multi tenancy, but I don't want to go like even even more over. So this could be like a I don't know follow up next semester or so. Um, if if yeah, if if everyone is happy with that. Yeah, I mean, I we've got probably time for one or two more questions from the audience. If we've got if there's anyone else who who wants to unmute. Yeah, I have a question, Etienne. You guys are at the bleeding edge of seeing some of these emerging applications. Does there a locus of application categories that tends to dominate what you're seeing? Is it like text search reimagined with through the lens of vector search, or is it all over the place? Um, I feel like both. <laughs> like it's on the one hand, <laughs> it's all over the place where we see these like wild ideas. So, so something like I had a question in, in a panel discussion the other day about agents where I said, I'm super bullish about like autonomous agents, not because I believe that we're there yet, but because the potential is so great because the like whenever, ever since I, I, so at first it was like, oh, what is, what is this agent things like? It's a new, new thing that now popped up out of, out of nowhere and now a new thing to, to sort of look into. Um, but once I, I sort of got the general idea of agents just being, any kind of automation that can replace sort of more complex human tasks, I all of a sudden see use cases for agents everywhere right now. So I don't know, flight got canceled, you get off the plane, help desk has a, a long line because 300 people that were on the plane all need to go to the help desk. I see like, oh, that's that's an agent problem in the future. So, so that's what I mean with the, they're all over the place. Um, but at the same time, when we're looking at sort of more moving into production, we do see a, a pattern of, so stuff like, um, uh, uh, sort of aiding support is super common in the in the rag use case so search through my knowledge base and just have either a chat pod or if it's not supposed to be conversational then just a better search on on yeah whatever the, the knowledge base is so so documentation these kind of things um document understanding i would say is also kind of that that direction of like we just have too much data for a human to to browse through and we need to to sort of summarize it but also identify what the the interesting parts are then retrieve stuff that's related to those interesting parts so where we quickly get into that that vector search category and i would say out of the use cases that are moving in in production these would be the the most common ones cool thank you i'm going to ask one question we've asked uh through through the seminar series uh this semester of of sort of what what is from your from your perspective uh your biggest unsolved problem, like if you could wave a magic wand and just solve one thing that that's just really challenging uh, your team, uh, do you have a, an example or, or an answer for that? Uh, yeah. So one thing that we see across the category right now is, um, and you can even see it sort of in those graphs right here, we're always talking about like throughput and accuracy trade-offs. I think no one right now has a good solution for people who say, I don't actually have high throughput requirements, but I have a massive data set, but I only send like one query a day. Like I'm not going to pay the compute for supporting tens of thousands of queries per second if I send one query a day, but I still want these insights uh, into, into uh, the data set. And then I think sort of the natural knowing databases and knowing what's happened in the space, like I think the, the natural progression to that would now be, we need to talk about a separation of storage and compute kind of architecture to, to potentially go in that direction where you don't pay for, for idle infrastructure. And that's, I, I think harder with vector search because you have these like massive monolithic indexes. Um, but also this is something I think that we, we to be able to, uh, to, to really serve all use cases, we, we need to challenge that idea. And I think we need to rethink in there. We're, we're doing some cool research, I think, right now to, to look into those use cases as well to make, in a sense, you could argue that it's just making vector search cheaper. But I think it's not just making it because like compression, for example, makes it cheaper. But it's still an architecture that prefers low latency and high throughput. But I think there are so many interesting cases that just have massive data set sizes and like sort of the more analytical use cases in nature. Um, and I think analytical vector search, maybe to, to put it in, in a way, is a super exciting topic uh, is not solved yet. <laughs>